I don't know if you've ever hiked the Arizona Trail, particularly the section between the Gabe Zimmerman Trailhead and Posta Camada Ranch. It's not a very long section, but about a mile before you reach Posta Camada, if you're heading north, and you look off to the east, you'll see something amazing. It's a castle. It's been called Agua Verde Castle. And it is a private residence, so don't go up there and say, hey, we heard about your castle in a sermon. No, the people that built this castle are very private people. And um, the only reason why I bring it up is because every time I see this castle, I'm amazed that somebody could actually build something like this. Now, if you get onto the Vail Preservation Society website, you can find a little bit about the history of the castle. But uh, one of the lines that struck out for me was the guy that built it. He said that uh, his wife was studying at the University of Arizona, but before they were married, he wanted to build her a castle. And so he did. He built a castle because she was his princess. That warms my heart. How many times throughout the history of mankind have men wanted to build a castle for their princess? It's every man's dream to do this sort of thing. But we don't, do we? No, most of us men are quite lazy. We're happy sitting idly around doing nothing. If we possibly can help it, we just like to sit in our nothing box and do nothing. So how is it that there are people that can actually accomplish these great things? Well, these are remarkable people. They have an idea and then they follow it tenaciously. They put aside other things that could occupy their time and they do everything they can to get this particular project completed. They're laser focused. And because they're laser focused, they have to say no to a lot of things so that they can say yes to the task at hand or yes to their castles. In other words, these are probably people that don't sit around on Sunday afternoon watching TV or watching sports or playing golf or doing the other things that the average American does. They don't spend their time on Facebook or all these other social media things. They really dedicate their whole entire lives to finishing these projects. And I must say that the world is blessed because of this. They get things done. Whenever they see a barrier, they push through the barrier. They find a way. Now, it's interesting. We used to celebrate people like this. We used to celebrate people that found a way through these types of things. It was part of our human vernacular. Like the old English proverb says, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Or how about this? Lord Chesterfield said, idleness is the only refuge of weak minds and it's the holiday of fools. Or Voltaire, who said, shun idleness. It is a rust that attaches itself to the most brilliant metals. Or even Benjamin Franklin, who said this, sloth, like rust, consumes faster than labor wears, while the used key is always bright. Notice that Franklin uses the word sloth. And if you'll remember in the historic church with the seven deadly sins, sloth was one of the deadly sins. Sloth, one definition says, sloth is a failure to do things that one should do. Though the understanding of the sin in antiquity was that it was laziness or lack of work, uh, it was also a symptom of the vice of apathy or indifference particularly an apathy or indifference or boredom with God. Concurrently, this apathy was seen as an inadequate amount of love. I thought that was interesting. Today, I'm not so sure that we are as industrious as previous generations. You know, sometimes we're lazy because of politics, sometimes big business. But throughout history, a big middle class of people who simply go along to get along. We don't do anything because it's easy, right? We don't build castles. We don't follow our passions. We just simply exist. You know, in Eastern cultures, 
one of the ways that you would not shame your community was that every day you would wake up and you would have a conscious decision about what is it that I'm going to do today to make the community better. And some of that's translated into the world around us, but for a lot of people it's not. They simply wake up and do their work, and at the end of the week they think, where did the week go? Was I idle? You know, idleness in small amounts is not a bad thing. I mean, look at the Ten Commandments. One of them is remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So there is time when we are to be idle to rest from our weariness, to pause and reflect upon our lives and that sort of thing. But when it's taken to an extreme, idleness can destroy relationships and society and even people. We're going to look at that today. We're nearing the completion of our series on making loving disciples. This is the idea that God plants a seed in you, and then that seed sprouts and grows, and then you bear fruit. And in that fruit are more seeds. Well, this bearing fruit are all the things that Christians do to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our society world around us. And that includes not being idle. And we're going to look about that today because Jesus wants us to create a culture that doesn't include idleness around us. In other words, let's look at this. The church has, Jesus has given people in the church time and talent and treasure. And God calls us to use that time and talent and treasure to the world around us. But one of the things that's a danger to the church is as they start to do that, there will be people that will game the system. There will be people that will remain idle because the church steps up and says, we are going to give to people who are in need. And sometimes they're not very careful about how they give to people in need. So there's a danger in giving that we need to talk about. There's a danger in bearing fruit that we need to talk about. And we're going to look at that by looking at Paul's second letter to Thessaloniki, the church in Thessaloniki. We're going to look at that this morning. So we're going to turn to 2 Thessalonians. We're going to start reading in chapter 3. And let's just begin reading at verse 6. Um, you can read along with me. Uh, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 6, or chapter 3, beginning of verse 6. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you've received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So we can tell by this context that this section is one of the problems in the church in Thessaloniki. And what prompted Paul to write this letter is that there were some people in the church who were idle. And these idle people were causing problems in the church. We don't know who these idle people are. It could be members of the congregation, it could be members of the community, uh, but we know that these people were, had a self-focused attitude. It was all about them. They were so important that they spent their whole existence telling people how important they were, right? And so therefore, since they're important, people should give them things without having to truly work for it. But if you look at who these people are, and you know who these people are, these are people who say they're important, but in actuality, they don't really get anything done. There used to be an old saying in the West, right, that these are people with all a hat and no cattle. In other words, they wear a big hat to show how important they are, but if you dig deep, they really have nothing to offer. And eventually, these people are found out, right? People begin to realize that they aren't doing anything. But in the church, these people are a danger. Jesus says, love your neighbor, help 
those who are lost, this lost stranger in need. But as soon as the church started doing this, there were people who stepped up and say, hey, this is a free lunch. I'll take it. Hey, I can't work either. I've got this problem or that problem. I can't do anything to help out in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to point out in the early church, they did give to widows and orphans, and they had no problem at all doing that. There is precedence in scripture that when a person is truly in need, the church should step up and help those who are in need. And I'm not talking about those people at all. That's actually what we should be doing. What I'm talking about is a little bit more devious. Those people who present themselves as having a need, but they really don't have a need. Now, one of the problems is you cannot tell if a person truly has a need or not. It is so difficult to tell. But God knows and these people know. These words from harsh from Paul seem harsh, but it is true. If you don't work, you don't eat. Or as the early catechism of the early church said, let the alms sweat in your palm before you figure out how to use it and who to give it to. In other words, don't just give people things because they say they are in need. Get involved in their life. Find out what the need is and if this truly will help them or not. That is what the church is called to do. We have to understand the whole person. Now, why would Paul be so harsh about this? Well, first of all, we know that idleness is a burden to the whole community, right? People who can work but don't work cause all sorts of problems. It means that the resources are drained from people who truly need it and it go to them. And this is a drain. It can distrain a whole society. I mean, what would it look like if you had a whole society of people and nobody worked? It just doesn't work. So yes, there is a true need for people who need to be helped, but there is a lot of people who present themselves as a need, and if they do that, and the whole society does that, the whole society can collapse from within. But that's only a secondary problem. There's really a deeper problem, and it's more important. And it's this, that having that kind of idea in your society cheapens the idea of work. It makes work seem like a dirty word. People say things like, oh my goodness, I have to go to work today. I don't like work and I can't wait until the time when I don't have to work anymore. And you know these people. Somehow in our culture, we've come up with this idea that work is bad and it's a necessary evil that we all have to do so that we can do the things that we really enjoy, the leisure things that we really enjoy. But my friends, that cheapens the idea of work. Work is honorable. Work is good. We were created to work, if you'll remember, in the Garden of Eden, right? God gave us two mans. The first one was to be fruitful and multiply, but the other was to subdue the world, to subdue the earth. My friends, that subduing the earth is, at its root level, work. We were created to be industrious. We were created to think. We were created to understand the world around us. That's part of the human condition. It shouldn't cause us to think that it's a bad word. It should cause us to think that this is an awesome thing that God has given us to do. It's a beautiful thing. It's part of who we are. Being industrious is part of how we were created. Now, it is true that after the fall, God put weeds around and made pain in childbirth so that it would be more difficult for us. But at our root, we were created to be industrious and to work and to learn about the world around us. Work is honorable. Work is good. In the 1930s, there was this economist named Maynard Keynes who said that because of industrialization, as the world got more industrialized, we would get to the point where maybe we only had to work a 15-hour work week and we could spend the rest of our time not at work. And I think that was a false thing that he said. First of all, it never happened. I mean, if you're only working 15 hours a week, um, it isn't because of industrialization. Uh, we, were, we have this propensity to want to work. It, it has nothing to do with the idea that none of us want to work. We, all of us um, will work 40 hours a week or more, right? 
Um, I used to blame government on this. I used to say it's because of all the taxes that they take out of our paycheck that that is the reason why we have to work so hard. But the older I get, the more I realize that it's just human nature to work. Of course we're going to work. What else are we going to do with our time? Work translates to food. Work translates to a paycheck. Work translates into self-esteem. The greatest self-esteem you can possibly have is to receive that first paycheck and say, I earned this. I did something to earn this. But oftentimes, we see work as something that's evil. We see work as something we want to get away from. And I believe that it's, it's uh, Satan trying to tell you that, that the, the goal in life is to not have to do anything. right? It's like that scene from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang where, they, where the, the guy comes along and he opens up the, the candy shop and he says, all free today, all this candy. And all the kids, you know, the two kids go in there and they close it up and it's a prison. You know, not being industrious, not working at some level, like a prison, because you weren't created that way. You were created to use the gifts that God's given you in the world around you. And that is truly what you were created to do. Ultimately, sitting idle with nothing to do is a manifestation of the root sin of mankind which is man focused in on himself. This whole year we've been focused on leadership. So I just briefly want to say that the church is a perfect way for people to get over this sin of idleness because we have incredible talent within the church where we can pull together people and we can think of ideas and we can vet those ideas and we can train people and we can go market for those ideas and then we do something for the world around us. The church is a perfect place to do that because we're unencumbered by all the things that the world's encumbered by. You know, when we first started Christ Lutheran Vale Church, when we did our first strategic plan in 2008, one of the core values was a partnership of the people. And what that meant is that we weren't going to make it so difficult to volunteer mm -hmm. church that you couldn't volunteer. One of our goals, our early goals, is that we wouldn't have any bench warmers. That we would, as a church, try to figure out an idea so that everybody does something according to the gifts and skills that God's given them. You know, organizing people into groups that utilize their gifts to serve the world, that make a meaningful difference in the world, that takes leadership, your leadership. And we're actually going to talk about this later in the year, so stay tuned because that's an important part of what we're going to talk about. But Paul isn't finished because it says, don't remain idle. But there's this other corollary to that that he talks about that I think is even more dangerous. We continue reading in verse 11. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. What is good. You know, if people who sit around would simply watch TV all day and kind of stay out of everybody's business, that would be one thing. But the fact is, since we're created to be not idle, we sit around and all of a sudden they become busybodies, right? We create dissension in the world when none is needed. Solomon is correct when he says in the Proverbs, this is Proverbs 16, 27, it's the translation of the New Living Translation, but this is what he says. He says, idle hands are the devil's workshop, and idle lips are his mouthpiece. You know these people. They exist everywhere. They exist in government. They exist in schools. They exist in media. They exist in community. They even exist in churches. And what's hard is that sometimes using your free time is good and wholesome, but there are many people who use their free time to just create division. They aren't looking for solutions. They just want to create something. They want to create an issue. They don't want to do the hard work of bringing people together and finding solutions and all move forward. No, they want to do the easy work of just complaining and being busybodies. Now, how do you know if the people are truly trying to be good, to use their free times for good, or how do you know if they're just being busybodies and creating dissension? I think the answer lies in their motive. Are they doing this for themselves or are they doing it for the world around them? But more importantly, and I think this is true, is do that they live in the world of lies or do they live in the world of truth? Do they deceive or do they tell the truth? Are they looking for solutions or are they just looking for division? That's truly the answer. We have an example of this in Acts chapter 6 
Apparently, the early church was distributing food to the widows. And they were distributing to the Jewish widows, and they were distributing to the Grecian, the Greek widows. And the Greek widows felt they weren't getting their fair distribution. So they were, you know, at some level being busybody, and they make a lot of noise. But the disciples came together, they listened, and they decided to start a whole new program with a whole new set of people to make sure that this problem was solved. And then the church went on. They say, okay, we found this problem, we moved on, we've now done that. That's a sign of a mature person who's truly trying to find solutions. What you don't see in the early church is these people continuing to be busybodies, to continue to divide the church, to continue to talk about the problems. They all came together, they found a solution, they moved on. There's a danger of letting people be idle. We used to talk about this. You know, sometimes there are people who are idle because they've never had to work. For some reason, they've been able to be idle without really having to work. They call that the idle poor, and sometimes the idle poor become idle rich. And these people can wreak havoc on a society because they didn't earn this. They just live off of other people. There's an old poem that says, when idle poor become idle rich, You'll never know who is who or which is which. But I've said, God knows. But other than that, you can probably slide by being idle for a long time. You can game the system and maybe nobody will know. And that should scare you. But listen to the words of Paul. He continues in verse 14. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Paul doesn't say to kick them out of the kingdom. And that's good news. He says, work with them. If you need to, shame them into working, but do whatever you can to bring them to understand that work is not bad, that work is how we are created, and that working actually fulfills who you are as the hands and feet of Jesus. And why does he have to say, why does he kick them out of the because All of us game the system, right? It's part of our human nature. Look back at the very first murder, Cain who killed Abel. Why did he do that? Because he thought by killing Abel, he would get all that love to himself. He'd get extra love that he didn't earn or desire, or that he didn't earn or build, right? But life doesn't work that way. There is no zero-sum game. By, By taking things from some other people doesn't mean that you get them yourselves. That life is complicated. The grass isn't always greener on the other side. You can't get more from your, for yourself by taking away from others. The only thing that you can do is to see who you are as God created you and do as best as you can with the hands and feet that God has given you. And when you do have the thoughts or even act out to get more than you deserve, you are not excluded from the kingdom because Jesus never gamed the system. He gave and he gave and he expected nothing in return. And his life allows you to enter into the kingdom to gain the real wealth that is waiting for you. Not because of any great thing that you did, but because of the great thing that Jesus did. Because he gave everything for you, his time, his talent, his treasure, everything for you so that you could be in the kingdom. You know, someday you will live in a castle. It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's a place that God is building for you right now. And in that castle are all the treasures that God has placed there waiting for you to get unwrapped, to see all the times that you were the hands and feet of God, and you'll be able to see that. That's the kingdom of God that remains forever. Because when you are in the kingdom, you are working, sometimes actively, sometimes passively, sometimes you act well and sometimes you act poor. But the kingdom is yours. Because of Jesus, the kingdom is yours. The castle is yours. The king is yours. And he calls us to not be idle, but to be his hands and feet in the world and to enjoy the eternal blessings of him as our king in the castle that he's preparing for us that we will someday see. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the hands and feet all the abilities that you've given us. Help us to use our gifts to further your kingdom,
to serve the world. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a few announcements. This is the second to the last uh, eight weeks of summer. and ne Next week will be the last eight weeks of summer, and then we go back to our normal schedule. Normal schedule means the office is opened again. Uh, we will have um, our radical program um, during church, and uh, that will start up again. And um, there's other activities that you can find about. Make sure you read about them in the weekly newsletter that's sent out. If you're not getting the weekly newsletter, contact the uh, office and make sure that you're getting put on the list. Those are the announcements I have, and I pray that God richly blesses you this week. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.